Hi everyone, let's get started. So, um, so we are towards the tail end of the course. Um, I saw some of your project proposals, submissions, and it's looking good. Uh, keep up, keep making up the progress. Uh, today we are going to be talking about the human angle in lossy compression, particularly focused on the vision aspect of it. So it's another sort of special topic. And it's going to be a fun lecture. <laughs> it's kind of stuff which is typically not covered in information theory, but it still finds its ways into like practical lossy compressors and stuff. Yeah, any, any questions, uh, by the way, so far on learned or logistics or anything? Cool. No? Okay. So yeah, so so far in lossy compression, we have looked at a lot of different things, right? So we have looked at quantization, which is the core mechanism of introducing loss. Uh, we have looked at third, third underpinning of a rate distortion trade-off. Homework 4 also has a question to like kind of get you warmed up and practiced about it. We have spent some time looking at optimal solutions in the case of Gaussian sources, which builds up our intuitions. Uh, as well as particularly focusing on MSE distortion, right? Like so far in the course, mostly we have stuck with MSE. Uh, and then we talked about uh, image compression and JPEG and learned image compression, okay? So this class is going to be very different. Um, so the main point is that like all multimedia, at least, eventually is consumed by humans, right? So it's like, it's for the human consumption and Human sensory, like human senses, play a big role in the design of these lossy compressors for multimedia. And we are gonna understand like what properties of this uh, sort of human sensory perception comes out and plays in, in our design of compressors. So in particular, we'll look at questions like, so why some of the design decisions were made in the image compressors we saw, like JPEG in particular. Or how can we further improve image video compression, knowing the fact that, oh, this content or this whatever signal is eventually supposed to be consumed by us, right? And not just by machines. Finally, I think we have touched in a little bit about it, but want to just give you guys a flavor on like, okay, MSE is not ever encompassing, right? So what are some other options which you might see if you, if you would practice compression uh, outside? Okay, so this talk is derived from lots of great resources. Feel free to check them out. Um, so even before we go into images, so this is really like, so teaser number one, okay? So what I'm showing here on the right is I'm using this tool, Media Info, and this is a compressed Pokemon theme.mp3 file. What this Media Info does is like it tells you various stuff about this compressed file. So for example, file size, duration, so on and so forth. Here you see the compression format is like MPEG audio, which is like parallel to JPEG. It's just omnipresent. And then if I keep going down, at some point I see two channels and I see sampling rate of 44.1 kilohertz, right? Uh, why do you think like, like this file or typical audio compressors have like two channels or this particular sampling rate? Yeah, so okay, as uh, answered, like he said, human hearing goes up to 20 kilohertz. That seems to give a hint. That's exactly correct. So the two channels is because we have two ears. If humans had three ears, maybe this file would have been compressed with three channels and that would have made better sense. So this very practical design decision, right? So this like, if, if I keep this file uncompressed, it would have, you are keeping 2x the number of channels. This very practical design decision was taken into account, like very simple fact, like we have two channels. And sometimes you want like stereo sound in, in, in your stuff, right? So this is why two channels. And 44.1 kilohertz is exactly again what Sean said. So if you, I don't know, go back to your uh, elementary biology, like you might have heard that, oh, humans can hear from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Though in practice, I, I don't know any human who could actually hear 20 kilohertz. So if you can, that's great. <laughs> and so if you know about uh, Nyquist criteria, you would you would need two times the highest frequency to uh, represent the signal without any aliasing. And that's where the 40 kilohertz come from. 
And then 44.1, it's even more fun. So you want to give some buffer because you don't have perfect low pass filters, which is typically required in these sampling techniques. So you, you had to give some buffer over 40. Um, and then 44.1 in particular is very interesting because it, it can be factorized by two, I think even three and five and multiple different primes. So that allows you to later on downsample the signal by throwing away samples much more easily. So even this innocuous, uh, very random looking number, it didn't magically come out. People thought about it, sat down, and then like, this is now default. So almost every file, like you don't think about it when you are saving an MP3 file, but these design decisions are there and they are determining the file sizes, right? So I can, I can just, I could have had double the sampling rate, half the sampling rate, and that would have completely changed my compression and file sizes and the kind of reconstructions we would have had. So very direct example of how humans are playing a big role. Like just the idea that humans are going to consume this plays a big role. Okay, then teaser number two. I have already asked this question. Uh, maybe let me ask it again, just, or I'll just go through this fast. But this is really a very iconic picture because it very clearly suggests what's happening in the image compression case. So here I have some source image. And all this B, C, D, E, F images basically have the same mean square error with respect to A. But clearly, if you look visually, uh, for me at least, B is much, much better reconstruction than any of the C, D, E, F. For example, C is like smoothened, E is extremely smoothened. Um, D and F have just clear noise sprinkled over, right? Um, so again, this clearly says that not only that um, a lot of design decisions were made uh, with humans in mind, if you are not careful about designing your compressors in future without taking that into account, you could have designed a compressor which would have resulted in reconstructions like this, which is just bad. That's, that's a bad design. Like nobody practically would like to keep a compressor which generates reconstructions like that. So it's also important to understand really for the design, practical design of compressors. Okay, so rest of the lecture will just get some preliminary understanding of how human vision works. Uh, we're gonna focus on the visual aspect of things. We are not gonna talk about the audio. We'll see its role in the design of traditional compressors, learn a bit more about perceptual metrics, and the last part would be like, how do you account for perceptual metrics eventually in this rate distortion kind of framework? So let's get started. Um, again, it's going to be fun, it's light, so it's, it's going to be different, so do interact. Uh, let's see how, how this goes. Uh, so this is just like a typical human eye anatomy. Um, so here you have some cornea people, your eye lens, which basically focus, the, focus any optical signal into the back of your uh, eye, which is this retina tissue. Here at retina, basically, you have transduction, which happens, which converts these light signals into electricity. And finally, like through this optic disc, uh, sorry, not optic disc, through your optic nerve, you send back these electrical signals back to the brain, which then process and makes you see different things. So right here is, is our first thing. Like when you actually have a, when you have a light source which is coming, suppose you have a light source which has a single intensity. So suppose you had a delta function in terms of pixels, right? Everything is black zero, and then just one pixel having very high intensity. When you look at back of the retina, it's no more a delta function. What happens is that this line function spreads out. Okay, so you have like a low pass filtering which your eye is doing right at the beginning just because of the physics and optics of things. Even, even before anything has happened. So this is important because this kind of goes back and correlates to our fact, right, that you can throw back high frequency stuff. Uh, that's because, hey, if there were like many of these lines close to each other, I wouldn't have been able to distinguish them anyways. So there is no point of keeping extremely high frequency stuff. And interestingly, like you can argue like nature also has signals which have very low power in the high frequency spectrum, right? And you can always argue like humans were designed to pick up signals like that versus like this is just like the basic optics of things, right? So it's interesting, right there you have, you have something which you can utilize in your comp compressors as soon as you understand this very basic thing. So this is a bit more detailed, uh, don't have to worry about it, this is just like the blown up part of this retina. What you need to basically 
think about is this. So suppose you are, you are watching your favorite Tom Cruise movie. Um, what happens is the light kind of falls in this first region, which is your photoreceptors. So this is just like blown up part of retina. These photoreceptors are what transduce this visual signal into electrical signals. Okay, so you have light to electrical conversion, like the wavelengths to electrical conversion, physical property to this electricity. And then you have a lot of these neurons, which are called RGCs or retinal ganglion cells. Again, don't have to worry about the names and details as long as you follow through the ideas, uh, which are basically these spiking neurons. So these issue like electrical spikes, which are then sent back to the brain which processes these electrical spikes and bring out some, some visual picture for you, like whatever you are seeing in this real world. And so here is the second big difference, sort of compared to how we think of images versus how humans process it. So we kind of treat images as an array of pixels, right? Like that's what you have seen, that's what you probably just think. If I, if I ask you generally, like sitting around, like what is an image, you'll probably say, oh, three RGB values, and like that's basically an image. Right? But humans are not really perceiving it like that. What happens in humans is that you basically have many different kinds of these retinal ganglion cells, uh, around 20, and each of them are basically independently tiling the whole screen, um, whole scene. So it's like, think of this as like one set of retinal ganglion cells, yellow ones as the other, green one as the third, blue as the fourth, and so on and so forth. And you can think that each of them basically sends an independent signal to the visual cortex. So it's like you have, it's debatable a lot of things, like we don't know very precisely, but this is still a relatively advanced field of new Different cells are basically extracting different features of the visual scene and then sending it back to the brain, right? So which is very different than how you would think of RGC, where each pixel is basically doing one thing and then you have you build machine learning models or whatever it is to extract different features. In humans' case, like it's like you already have these feature extractors in some sense, uh, right at the beginning, right at the retina, right? And then you, on top of it, build using your visual cortex, like much more complicated uh, associations in your brain. So again, like the difference is human retina is not your camera. It's not just pixel array. It's doing something very different, the back end. In particular, I think these rod and cone cells, um, again, like a lot of this is even at GK level you might have heard at some point. Uh, but it's, it's very interesting because these do dis dis a lot of uh, interesting things. So these rod and cone cells are really important because uh, these are our photoreceptors. These are our sensors. This is how we are sensing the physical signal coming into our eye and making some interpretation out of it. Um, and these are actually very, very amazing. Okay, so first of all, rods, uh, they are responsible for encoding intensity. So their only role is to figure out like what's the intensity of the scene which is coming in. No color information, nothing else. And these are amazing because they are like quite a number, like almost 100 million. But even more than that, they are able to adapt so as to see almost a dynamic range of 10 raised to 9, like almost a billion orders of magnitude. What I mean by that is like, think, if you are a human, you can be sitting in outside uh, California summer weather. Uh, after a while, you can see everything there. And then suddenly you have a class, you rush into your class and it's a dark room. Okay, initially you're not able to see anything for maybe a few seconds, but within a few seconds, your eyes adjust and you're able to see everything in, in this room. Now think about like, what's really the physical signal which is coming into your eye, right? When you are outside in the sun, your intensity was extremely high, right? And then everything else which was happening was around this base level. Whereas when you came into this dark room, suddenly the intensity fell significantly, right? And then you were basically seeing stuff around this level, okay? And this is a hard problem if you think about it, right? Like our cameras have struggled to adapt to it uh, till date. Like, uh, I don't know, iPhones, one of the selling point is great night pictures. Right? Like, why? Because it's, it's hard to detect things at that level of intensity level. And we as humans, we just do it. And we don't even realize, right, when we are doing that. And rods basically have, they, they are the contributors. Their only role is to adapt to intensity, figure out, um, and change sort of like the base level around which they are gonna kind of see the fluctuations 
and see things around you. Okay. Um, and another very interesting thing about rods is, so if you look at this diagram here, you can think of your eye as like a spherical surface, right? And then there are like, you can, you can basically put angles to the retina of where things are happening. And very interestingly, you have some optic nerve, which is sending signals back to the brain. But where this optic nerve connect, you don't have any sensors. You don't have any retina. So whatever falls in sort of this region, you can't detect it. And it's like a fun exercise if you want to do that, like, uh, I, I don't know, I find it fun. You kind of just focus on your thumb and you keep seeing straight and keep moving your thumb at around, so I can see my thumb, 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 it just vanishes for me. <laughs> and then it comes back. Like you can, you can try it now, try it at home. That's like a consequence of having this blind spot, basically. That at certain angle, I just have this blind spot where I just, I can't see because all the light there is being focused in this region. Um, but even more interesting than that, so here is like y-axis shows the density of these receptors. So you can think of how many sensors you have in that region. If you look at the solid line, the rods, so they are present almost everywhere in the retina except like this region, which is your blind spot, like around whatever, 20 degrees. Uh, the other cell type, which are called cones, on the other hand, if you see their density, Cones are basically not present almost in whole of retina, except near this almost zero degree angle. Okay. And the role of cones is exactly opposite to rods. So rods are just basically trying to understand the intensity. It's giving you the dynamic range. Cones are responsible for colors and details and all those things. Right. And they are completely absent in the retina, except for maybe a very small part of your central vision. Uh, Right? Uh, and this central part is called basically phobia. Um, again, why is this interesting? Um, so, if you think about it, if we only have high acuity or high resolution vision in such a small part, like if you think about it, this is just like a few angles, you can convert it into physical angles. It's like really small region of the physical world which you are sampling with sort of this uh, uh, high fidelity, like other places you are just encoding like a grayscale kind of level to get adjusted. Um, so then how am I able to see this sort of scene in a very smooth and nice fashion? Right? That's an, that's an interesting question to maybe think about. And the reason for that is we are actually never seeing any, uh, any static scene. So when you think you are like just looking uh, and you're seeing an image, that's not really true. You are actually not seeing an image. At any given point, you are seeing a video. And your eye is not really focusing at one point. What it's doing is your eyeball, really, um, it's not eyeball, sorry, the eye in general. Like It's doing these movements called saccadic movements, uh, which is just basically like it's moving really fast. Like you don't even know, but it's continuously doing this. The reason it's moving this fast and it's doing this is to basically keep changing the point of the physical scene, which points to my, my central region, my fovea. So think of it. It's like there's a very small point at the center where you have uh, high resolution. Everything around it is low resolution. Okay. So when I'm looking at this scene, if I just do this, if I just, I don't know, and right now I'm just completely focusing on clock and actually all of your faces, all of this thing has really vanished for me. I can't see it. If I like very consciously focus, right? But if I'm being subconscious, I'm not consciously putting my eye to say, okay, just look at one point. What my eye really is doing, it's, it's sampling this region, but it's not staying there. It's like my micro saccades are in like milliseconds case. It's basically just continuously moving and sampling. And then your brain is interpolating all the signal to form this continuous kind of smooth looking, smooth looking picture. Right? So again, like a lot of fun facts. This class is going to be a lot of things like that. Uh, so, yeah, so it's, it's pretty cool. Like, when I first learned about it, uh, it was amazing. Like, my eyes are not staying at the same spot. But now you can be like, uh, Pulkit, why are you talking about this, right? Like, uh, there are so many GK questions. <laughs> can do so many things. This idea that you have very high density sensors in a single place, 
uh, it's actually called foveation. Um, and it can be exploited in some very interesting ways um, in, in, your, um, in, in your design of physical sensors and how you do compression. Okay? So for example, what it says is that at any given point of time, um, I'm only sampling small region in high density. So then it makes me think maybe we can exploit this in, in some way, right? Maybe if I am able to track human vision, let's say, then I can, if I know, right, okay, at this particular second, I'm just looking here. Let's say next second, I'm looking here. And if I can work at this latency and just track my human eye is going to look more densely at a particular part of a scene when you are watching your favorite movie or anything it is, then I don't need to give too many bits to everything else, right? I can just give more rate to wherever my humans are focusing and I can give zero rate to things outside. And this may sound very sci-fi, but there have been like over the past few years, there have been like lots of interest and research projects trying to exploit exactly this idea in the VR setting. So right now we are only focused in 2D setting, but now you can think if you have a VR headset, maybe we can do something to actually track where humans are looking. And maybe we can we can figure out like how to distribute bit rates because in VR you now have a 3D environment, right? You don't want to give equal bits to everything on the periphery. So the things, the kind of things which we are learning also have implications for future technology, right? It's not just things which we have right now. Like lots of cool projects along this basic idea. Um, yeah, I think we talked about the first one. Um, just like if you have seen this before, so the adaptation aspect of human eyes, it's basically called Weber's law, which basically says that we only care about relative changes, not the absolute value of changes. Um, again, very small point, but it's very interesting how you can exploit it in your signal processing and compression aspects. Um, what it says basically is like a bit change at a high value of luminance value would not really, um, I won't, it won't be as significant as a single bit change at a low luminance value, right? Even though it's exactly one bit change. So you need to be careful about when assigning like rate and all those things in these situations. Or maybe you are uniformly assigning the rate. In that case, you may have like different artifacts which might be visible to you just because those artifacts are occurring in like low, uh, low intensity region versus the high intensity region, yeah? Again, this aspect, maybe it wasn't so important 20 years ago. But we are in a world where we have 4K TVs, HD, 4K. Um, like, I'm pretty sure we are not going to stop there if we can fit all that data and be able to process this. We want, like, million more <laughs> pixels in our cameras, like, million more pix pixels in our TV, right? And at even 4K HD level, like, all of these effects starts becoming very significant. And, like, the big companies spending big money trying to understand these issues and improve upon them because it's like straightforward money, right? Each bit saved our your user experience. So simple idea, but can be exploited in interesting ways in engineering setting. Okay, uh, I'll pause for a second, any questions? No? All right. So the next thing is, so we were just talking about cones, which look at colors. What this plot shows is on the x-axis, it's the wavelength, which is how like light is sort of, colors are represented physically, right? Colors are just different wavelengths. Um, so 400 to 700 nanometer is roughly our visible range, 350 to 700, I think. And then y-axis is basically the response for these cones um, at different levels of wavelength. So think of these as sensors. These different sensors respond differently to different wavelengths. Okay, and then what you see is that you parts which basically respond to roughly like the, it's not really the, it's something, but it's roughly responding to the average wavelength or in the visu visible spectrum. But then you actually have three cones. And these three cones are sometimes called LMS, uh, just long, medium, small. L for long for like long wavelength, medium is for medium wavelength, small is for small wavelength. So that's the um, neuro terminology for this, these. Now, why do you think you have three cones? <laughs> like, do you think that makes sense? Or is it something confusing? Yeah, the answer is on this slide, by the way. <laughs> you don't even have to think that much. 
So I'm sure at some point you would have wondered, oh, why RGB? Where did this RGB thing came from? Like, at least I used to wonder quite a lot. <laughs> like, why RGB? Why are we stuck with these three colors? And that actually comes down because your, your physical, like your human retinal sensors, cones, actually come in three flavors. And they are roughly sampling the red color, the green color, and the blue color. Um, and that's why like RGB is one of the ways you would like to represent because back in 1700s, uh, a lot of philosophers where you couldn't actually do these experiments through other psychovisual experiments figured out that, okay, maybe RGB seems to have some special space, uh, place in our, in, our, uh, in our vision. And that basically later on in neuroscience you could figure out, you could even figure out like their exact response characteristics, so on and so forth. So again, like even something like RGB has, it's actually other way around, like RGB doesn't come from here. Like since we have these things, that's why RGB has found like a special kind of place in our thinking about visual images. And so this RGB color model, uh, this is also sometimes called trichromatic theory of color vision. So fancy name, but just English trichromatic theory. But interestingly, <laughs> trichromatic theory is not the only theory of colors, right? Um, at some point, you might have, so these are two physical colors which are exactly same. I could have represented this as RGB, like some different values of RGB, which gives me a certain color. But maybe you have heard of a color space called CMYK. Uh, probably not, so this used to be used in old school printers with, with toners where so RGB is like an additive color space where oh, I add R, I add G, I get a color. In this case, like these values of RGB gives this color. But I can also think of it as like CMYK, which are sort of like subtractive colors. So when you add CM and Y, you get like a black. So it's like removing sort of thing, but it's the same color. So nobody said like, oh, I need to represent this as just this RGB. I could have represented this as CMYK. <laughs> and actually on the right, what I'm showing is this is actually a very complicated and not so obvious and confusing topics for, topic for engineers, like where, where does these things come from? But actually there have been a lot and lot and lot of studies on like how colors are represented, not just at the neuro or engineering level, but actually at the psychovisual level. So at the end of the day, this is like a, a psychophysics experiment, right? Like what colors do you see? Like how can I represent the same color? Um, and there have been Tons and tons and tons, like philosophers all the way back, I think, and starting from 1700s, uh, people have been asking these questions, trying to understand them in deeper and deeper details. And this is something which you might hear if you work in image compression, video compression at some point. So the CIE, it's like just a society, in 1931 came up with something called chromaticity diagram. So again, chroma for color. And it looks like, to, it basically looks like 2D space to represent colors. And what you have is like different standards and companies, etc., have adopted very different color spaces. So you have RGB, which we know of. There is something called sRGB. Okay, so first of all, there is something called visible spectrum. Like, so invisibly, we can only see these colors. So this has a weird space. I'm not going to go into details of why, but if you're interested, come talk to me later. Um, but yeah, so the yellow one is the set of colors which your human eye can see. Okay, and then in practice, you actually can't represent those many colors in the same way as you would like to. So historically, people came up with RGB, then there is sRGB, which is this black curve here. There was Adobe had an RGB, which is like Adobe RGB, which is this one. So Adobe basically came up with its own RGB standard. Now you, you should ask like, okay, why am I talking about these standards, right? The reason is this 224, 102, 102, right? We simplified our discussion of images and we just said, oh, it's like three byte per pixel, which responds to one color. But that's not true. At the end of the day, these digital values are converted into physical signals using your monitor. Maybe they are printed using your printer. Uh, Maybe the, the, the actual, your camera when it was recording, it was converting this physical signal to this RGB values. And all of this sort of depends on what's the color space, right? Like, so for example, if a display has a different color space, then 
whatever it was recorded with, you will get very different reconstruction. And that's important for us because that changes the distortion completely, right? So you might have to think about these things. And again, it might seem like, hey, we never, never think about it, do it, but um, it's, it's like, it's actually very common and you have some very interesting bugs which come up if you were doing video compression, image compression, if you are not being careful about these very small things. Because like just different data recorded in different way, displayed in different way and you'll be like, uh, you'll be thinking why is my uh, Huffman encoder not working or whatever, LZ variant not working, but it will be this color space issue which you might be sitting with. So it's just important to know that these things exist and do play a role. Okay, so this is, this is gonna be fun. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit more. Um, let's do this. Um, by the way, yeah, like, actually just a quick show of hands. Like this dress, I think, blew up sometime last year or, or year before. Um, how many of you see this as uh, gold and white? Oh, okay. How many, what do you see it as? Let me ask, I forgot what's Blue and black, excellent. So, okay, how many of you see it as blue and black? Like, why is it happening? It's the same RGB values I'm showing here, right? <laughs> so, right there, it's very interesting, and we'll motivate this for the for the next next thing. But even before that, let's let's do this quick uh, quick experiment. I think, oh, yeah, it loaded. Okay, so what I want you guys to do is, okay, first of all, what do you see here? Don't focus anything. Just look around. What do you see? Anyone? What? See something? Okay. Do you see a vanishing purple circle, sort of, right? Okay. Now focus on the X. Just on the X. I just want you to focus on the X. This is going to work in this room or not. Let me also come here. Oh, what happened? You see a yellow dot? Okay. Any, anyone else? You saw a whole circle of yellow dots. It's interesting. Okay, I would have called that color green, but maybe it's yellow. It yeah, it's like greenish yellow, right? So if you keep focusing on that X, the vanishing one suddenly becomes like a greenish yellow color. <laughs> like again, it's it's not your vision. It, it's it's nothing wrong with your eyes. You don't have to go to go get new glasses after this. It's very it, it's a known effect. And that happens because, so we talked about the trichromatic theory of color, but there is another theory of color, which is basically called this opponent process theory of color vision. Okay, which basically said that there are pairs of colors which are negatives of each other. So the effect, by the way, which I showed you in the last slide, it's called the after images effect, which is like if you focus on one color, it's like your eyes are adapting to subtract that color out. So suddenly when you look at somewhere else, your, oh, sorry, your mean color is somewhat very different. And so that white space in that previous lilac chaser example suddenly becomes like negative of red, which is what you sort of saw. Like not really negative of red, but which is that yellow, green, whatever color you guys want to call it. Right? So that's like, a, again, a very basic aspect of how our human vision works. And that's the sort of origin of this why UV thing, <laughs> uh, which we have talked about uh, in the class before, right? Like we had this random color transform, which we said, okay, let's do Y UV. We are not going to work with RGB. And I said, okay, later on, we'll talk about a little bit more about this. And it's basically this theory of color vision, which, um, which suggests the idea of this opponent colors, which basically says that, oh, maybe we have this, blue, green, and red cones. The way humans perceive it is actually not these signals, but you merge them. You merge them in a sense where you get this white and black signal, which is basically somewhat summation and addition of all these three wavelengths. White is presence of all these three, black is subtraction. Then you have a blue yellow, and then you have a red green opponent colors. Um, and it's, it's debatable. We don't there have been lots, lots and lots of empirical evidence on all sorts of axes. We haven't really finalized on what is correct, but it's like even very recently, I think 2019 or 2020, 
there have been papers that say, hey, this theory is wrong, or this is right, like, here is more evidence. So, and this has been going on since, I think, 1800s. So it's very interesting. But for better or worse, we are stuck with this. And we have, this shows up in our engineering applications all the time. So again, like just recall our image uh, JPEG compression, right? So we started with RGB. And the first step was a transformation. And then we also briefly touched upon that we are going to downsample the CBCR components or UV components. Um, and then everything is a standard thing. Now we can understand this better. So uh, why CBCR or UB? Like all of them are, consider them equivalent. Like they have some historical differences. But for today's class, assume why UV, why CBCR. Sometimes you'll see like star marks on top of it, like literally like this CB star CR. Oh yeah, here, sorry, Y dash UV. Sometimes you'll see like Y dash UV, Y dash CBCR. Consider all of them equal for now. They, there are slight nuances and differences which we can talk. But the main reason for maybe if we think about CBCR, it's very obvious. Y of going for the Luma component, CB is going for this blue yellow, and CR is sort of going for this red green. Right, so that's kind of modeling the human vision, and that's why we are splitting it in these three independent channels because that's what we think our eye sort of works with. And so again, if you have this image, this is how your YCB and CR might look like. And we said that oh, these still have a lot of correlation, right? Um, so okay, so this explains why we do, did the uh, color transformation from RGB to YCB CR. But if you recall, we also talked about downsampling, right? And then I said something that, oh, like you actually downsample the colored components more than the Luma ones because we care more about the average intensity than the everything else. So that's the other reason for actually even converting your RGB signal into these three independent channels because these three independent channels are behaving differently. You care more about Y than CBCR. And that again comes from human, okay? So really the two reasons for doing this color transformation is one is like the perceptual color space based on this idea of uh, opponent theory like that lilac chaser or that dress thing. And the second main idea is that you have different contrast sensitivity for your color channels versus Luma channels. If you haven't heard this before, let me just explain the idea very quickly. What your contrast sensitivity says, this is like similar to saying humans can hear 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Similarly, there are certain, so certain spatial frequencies um, and certain contrasts. So you can think of contrast just as the, um, the variance around, around that point, like how much the level shifts when you change one pixel versus, when you change one byte versus two byte versus four bytes, you are changing different levels of intensity. And so at, so your contrast really is like a function of your contrast plus spatial frequency. So what I have here in this image is there are bars with increasing and increasing spatial frequency. Okay. And as you go down, I have higher differentials between these bars, binary bars. For me, I can make out like bars maybe in this region. This red line is supposed to be for a typical human, average human. Everything within it, you should be able to distinguish as like some lines versus around here, you should sort of see it as a gray area. Now for different people, it might be different. For example, for me, I actually think can't see any of this region, can't see this region. So my, my eyes are not perfect, right? So like you have this different contrast sensitivity. And this is important because like, again, like you can, what this tells is like whether you can distinguish two sig signals or not occurring at different spatial frequencies. Why do you care about this? Can, can somebody think about why would I care about this uh, for, for, for designing compressors? Anyone? Not that hard again. Yeah? Like for things that like, you can't see anyways, I guess you can just Exactly. Where the things I can't see anyways, I can just throw away. So if I have some physical signal or some RGB values with Luma values lying in here, very low spatial frequency, oh, I could have actually increased the distortion. Sure, my mean square error would have been high for the, that particular reason, but I don't care. Like humans don't care. So again, like very simple idea. 
but immediate immediate impact on the right basically is a plot which shows this exact contrast sensitivity again spatial frequency but for the luminescence component so the y sort of component and the cbcr components and what you see is that your contrast sensitivity falls very fast for the colored components and that again says is that oh i can throw away more stuff i don't really need high resolution even like we talked about throwing away bits maybe i can reduce the resolution i i don't need like why do we need resolution to keep account of higher and higher spatial frequency what this suggests is you can throw away colored uh, you can down sample the colored signals and that's exactly what we do right so the down sampling step is sort of applied to the cbcr channels and not to the y channels and things still work out fine um which again is motivated by how your human vision works so this particular curve actually has lots of implications for us uh so again like the higher quantization of high frequency dct components you can again trace it back like i have been hand waving humans don't see high frequency what does that really mean like this is one way to quantitative quantitatively think about what we mean by high frequency and what we can't see really right um this has implications for chroma subsampling what we just talk about like why we do chroma subsampling something which we didn't talk about in class in as detail but just like hand waving mentioned you actually have different quantization matrices itself for luma and chroma components so that basically says you have a very different design of rate distortion trade off for the luma luma components versus the chroma components and that again is motivated by just this curve and all of these are used in jpeg right like like people knew about it this this is being exploited in jpeg and then i want to show you this thing first so this is just an example right so we looked at it in the previous class so by cbcr you take this rgb you convert by cbcr you down sample the cbcr i just wanted to remind the numbers and there is a demo you can go in that link and play with this idea of how much you can subsample without losing any perception um when you don't down sample this is what the image looks like and when you do jpeg compression on top of it you get like 323 kilobyte bit from 4, 429 kilobits all of these images are roughly at think of them at similar level of distortion okay versus if i do this chroma down sampling and then i so okay chroma down sampling itself gave me some obviously advantage in terms of compression so i got like 429 to 352 but personally i can't see any difference between these two images which is the whole point like we as humans our eyes work that way that i can't see these differences so that's advantage number 1 just down sampling gave me some advantage but then since i have down sampled now recall how jpeg works right since i have down sampled now there is higher correlation between neighboring pixels for these channels so my compressor on top of this straight up advantage by down sampling can also exploit that there is more correlation in this channels and so once you do this down sampling and then you apply jpeg you get like almost similar quality image at 176 kilobit kilobit yeah which is like almost half of if you weren't applying this down sampling and then using jpeg so the advantage is sort of multiply it's not just staying there and the way this down sampling works is like you will hear terms like 444 422 420 420. so for example here it's it's called yuv 420 you will hear terms like this quite often um what this 420 sort of is saying is just saying it's defining how are you down sampling the chroma components so for example 444 is like full full resolution so if you had eight colors you are representing it as some eight blocks of colors or eight pixels whichever way you want to think of it uh you have some y components and you have cr cb components and you have unique values for each of these pixels right but when you are down sampling what for example happens in 420 is obviously you keep the same y whatever y you had but now you take the average of uh, the uh, uv components basically so now instead of using eight colors to represent it you are only using four colors so you combine this two block these two blocks these two oh, only sorry two colors not four my bad so you are basically combining this into single block so you are throwing away a lot of information right from this color to you just went to a single color and 420 is like default option in a lot of uh, like video compressors image compressors it's actually quite common so here like for example it's with 420 and uh, 
Yeah. So it's good that we have this property, but we have to be careful, right? So this is something which we introduced. And this now leads to some very interesting issues in life and practice. So now suppose you had a very high frequency, like you just had an array of pixels where the four pixels were red and everything else was blue, okay? Now if you downsample it to something like four to zero, you actually get an image which looks like this. And in this case, now there are very specific chromatic artifacts, right? It's like you will see different color. Um, so where do you see like these effects even more like these edge effects? So for example, let's imagine you had a terminal screen grab, like uh, the quick brown fox done jump over this lazy dog. This is like your screenshot. And let's say I'm just using my compressor. I applied my compressor. It does by UV 4 to 0 down sampling. In that case, what will happen? It's going to do this sort of averaging of pixels in this 2 to window. And this is the output which you get. So in this case, you still see maybe the right edges, but the color itself changed, right? So this is suddenly like in terms of maybe mean square error, not that high a difference compared to just applying by UV 4 to 0 in some other case. But this is extremely lossy. You just change the color itself. So you have to be careful while doing these downsampling and things like these artifacts show up in different ways in different situations. Okay, I'm gonna pause for a second. Any any questions? Okay. Final topic, uh, final, I guess, point about Bayou V is cool. We talk so much about Bayou V, great, right? But what exactly is this RGB to Bayou V conversion? Like, how, how do you go from RGB values to Bayou V values? Again, if you're a complete newbie, you probably wouldn't care, right? But this is, again, I would say 101 in video and image compression. Like, if you're working on these, these are the issues you sort of struggle with many times in practice in life um, and the way this the answer really is it's not as simple as it sounds because because of all that color spaces mess which we talked about like all the color spaces can mean many different things and so there are various different standards for example for your SDTV color space there is one standard to convert your RGB so this is just like a matrix multiplication right and similarly for your um, sRGB color space with HDTV, you have some other, some other YUV conversion matrix. Um, and many times you again get like very interesting bugs if you are like practically working on these things, if you are not being careful about the color space which you are working with, like the YUV con conversion color space. So again, all of these are like also a lot of practical tips. If you start working in these areas, these things will come in hand handy. Okay. So let's get that slide. I just want to get here. So now I used another tool called EXIF tool, doesn't matter. And I took the Stanford logo dot JPEG. Um, and I asked, I just show the output here. Okay. And so the idea after this class really at this point is that you should be able to take JPEG image, right? At least or some compressed image and at least be able to explain what are the various components which are part of this JPEG image. So if you look at the output, okay, initially it's all fine. It's directory, file size, whatever, some file permissions. Now some interesting stuff starts coming in. Okay, big NDN, et cetera, it's just like standard computer yeah, stuff. Color space, this says color space is sRGB. So hopefully now you know, maybe not exactly, but roughly you know what that means. Like how, how do I exploit that or use that? You have some image width, et cetera. Like if you look at the encoding process, you see baseline DCT, Huffman encoding. Should, you should immediately know what happened here, right? So uh, like what exactly was used. Coming down, you see bits per sample is eight, color components is three, so like no alpha channel in this particular one. It's just eight bit, not, not 12 bit HD uh, image. Then you see why CBCR subsampling. In this case, it's four to zero. Again, this is a standard image downloaded from the internet. You can mostly assume that if it's it would be most likely four to zero. That's the most used default option for subsampling, right? So, okay, so at this point, I really hope that something like JPEG, traditional compressor is really clear and you can, you can start playing with various components of it as and when needed. 
I'm gonna pause here for a second. I think we are gonna change topics after this. So, any questions? No? Good. Okay, so we looked at one aspect of human vision and how it specifically led us to take many design decisions in JPEG, which is like very famous traditional image compressor. Now let's talk about this idea of distortion metric, right? Like, so thing we have said it at least 10 times at this points in this class that MSC is a bad distortion metric for practical components and our golden image is back to help us. Um, so roughly, so like the idea is to go towards more perceptual metrics. As the name suggests, they try to model how human perception or how human distortion works and you can roughly think of them as part of being three classes okay like there are three ways you might want to attack this problem as of today um, so one way is like okay one idea is maybe we should model these low level human vision features right we talked about all of these different things why can't we model them right we can model it and then we can instead of msc which is a simple formula maybe we'll have something a little bit more complicated and we'll use that as a distortion metric and that will be a better guide of how to do rate distortion optimization okay the second idea is to use like this modern big learned machine learning models right a lot of people have figured out that oh these actually extract very relevant features very similar features to humans and maybe we can use like these huge models to actually extract the relevant information out. Okay, so actually let me also throw some terms. So this modeling low level human vision features led to metrics such as SSIM, MSSSIM or VIF. Again, if you go read any paper on image compression, video compression, they'll, as of today, they would almost 100% include some comparison of distortion with SSIM. You probably can't even publish or convince anyone that your compressor works better if you only report results for distortion with MSC. So this is like a 2002 paper. It has really become industry standard, like not even industry academia everywhere. It's, it's a standard that's like one of the early works which tried to model human visual perception. Moving on this idea of LPEPs, which is now using big, big learned machine learning models as a proxy to what human vision might be doing and using them as a measure of distortion. The most popular work is something called LPEPs, right? You don't have to remember these terms. You can come back, see this slide, but you might see these terms if you're working and doing research in these areas very frequent. So that's another sort of LPEPs itself is not a distortion metric. It's just uh, method which using which you exploit some distortion metric and it basic idea is it uses this learned ML models and then the third idea is somewhat in the middle which is okay let me maybe come up with simple features not learned hand designed features right like somewhat like first one but I'll combine them with like different parameters using machine learning like using some human vision experiments so in this one, you are learning all the features. In this one, it's everything, handwritten rules. Uh, the third one, it's more like somewhere in the middle where you know what features to extract, but then you decide how to combine them by doing a lot of subjective studies and so on. So now people did that and now it's fixed. So as to say, and like the most famous of this is like VMAF, which is like, uh, which is used by Netflix, popularize and it's like, like any video paper, video compression paper would have a VMAF score related to it. So it's like very recent again. So this was like, SM was something like 2002. So all of these are this century, by the way. Before that, we weren't even at level that we cared about things. So SM is something like 2002. LPIPS, I think, is like uh, 2018, 19, something like that, maybe 20. And then VMAF is again, I think, 20, 15, 16, something of that. So all of these are like pretty new methods and it's a really hot area of research like if you figure out solve this problem it's really relevant in terms of resources you can save like smartly allocate bits as well as like big money for different different aspects okay so i'm not going to go into too much details about any of this but i think all of these are important so let me just give you a five minute overview of the basic ideas used okay in these things 
So SIM. Uh, this is now a figure from the paper. Very like first look, you might get scared. Don't get scared. It's actually not that hard. The basic idea really is like SIM. It's from structural similarity. That's where the SIM terms come from. It uses three key features to basically compare any two images. So distortion is between two images, right? Like you need original reconstructed or between two. It's like distance. The way it constructs that is it takes into account the luminescence because it says like, okay, the average Y value is what we as humans care about. The contrast, again, something we as humans care about and the structure. And this is the paper actually, which is the source of this image, which we have been showing. Like they were the ones to very clearly show that these things matter. Uh, the way you compute luminescence is just like mean of blocks X and Y. And so you have some L between X and Y, luminescence distance between X and Y images, which is just some function of mean of X and mean of Y. Let's not get into details. But again, any, any topic about this lecture, if it interests you, come talk to me later. We can discuss more. The contrast, like I said, it's just like variance, right? Like how much, how many of these pixels are changing, and that's how they model it. Again, like some function of the sigma x and sigma y. Okay? And the structural similarity is just the idea that uh, basically whether these, what sort of the covariance between these two images, right? Like whether, do they have the edges at the same places? Do they have the shallow regions at the same places? So on and so forth, right? Um, and that's being captured by basically the sigma xy, which is just the covariance matrix or correlation matrix between these two images, x and y. And then you take this, you compute these three scores. That's what's being shown like in a diagrammatic fashion here. And then you combine these three scores to get this SM score finally between two images, x and y. Um, and it looks something like this where you have different values of alpha, beta, gamma, it results in some formula. Um, today you will find like many, many implementations for SIM, but the idea is actually not that hard, right? All you are doing is computing some second order terms between these two images, and then you are using them as distortion metric. Okay. And again, all of this is visually motivated. Luminescence is important. Contrast is important. Structure is important. Like it's going away from the MSE. So it's just trying to model this low level behaviors. Another, um, okay, so I'm not going to go into details of this, but another very interesting factor is the way you compute this mean variance and the covariance. So that's not, that's typically like, for example, mean, it's not just taking average of pixels, it's actually some weighted average of pixels. And again, the only reason I want to tell you about this, like why you want weighted average of pixels, um, Okay, it's a heuristic. There isn't really like a theorem to sort of prove it. But the idea really is like it sort of accounts for foveation, which says that, oh, if I'm focusing on this block and I'm calculating like the difference in two images in a one particular block, I should put more value to the center aspects than the side aspects. Because in some sense, when I'm going to look, I'm going to look less towards the side. Right? So this weight aspect is sort of a Gaussian kernel. Motivation is foveation. Again, it's all, it's all hand wavy, but that's, that's why they do it, right? And then what they could show is that this SM metric uh, collaborates much better with humans' judgment compared to the mean square error. So in future, people also extended it to some more interesting ideas. There is something called MSSM, again, very common. MS is for now multi-scale. And the idea really is you keep applying this SIM. Uh, so you apply SIM for the signal one and signal two. Then you downsample both of them. Then you apply again. Then you downsample both of them. Then you apply again. And you keep doing that. And then you somehow combine them. Um, why would you want to do that? So there the idea is you want to see how this, uh, how this image responds to various different spatial frequencies, really. And the idea is, is that we almost have different independent channels for different spatial frequency. Our contrast behaves differently, so on and so forth. And what they showed us, like, this is like a decent improvement over SM. So again, like a very commonly used metric in all sorts of image and video compression works. Then the second idea was around this LPIPS. Um, and this is just like a quote from this paper. LPIPS is, again, so a lot of acronyms in this area. 
I don't know why, but I think it's okay. <laughs> so LPIPS is for Learned Perceptual Image Patch Similarity. And I think the name kind of, like if you just want a thousand feet overview, the name gives you what, what it might be doing. Uh, the basic idea really is, and this is like an image from the same paper. So this is like a quote from the paper which says, our results suggest that perceptual similarity is an emergent property shared across deep visual representations. Very fancy word, but very fancy line, but if you understand machine learning, what these are saying is that your learned features themselves are somewhat representative of what humans uh, would have looked as features in these studies. And the way they, the way they go about doing it is they use this deep embeddings as a feature space and then define some distances over these embeddings, neural net embeddings, which are like outputs of these neural nets to determine, okay, uh, a new distortion metric for humans. Uh, sorry, a new distortion metric for compressors. And so like, for example, what you can see here is, let's say this is your reference image. Um, this is like one compressed image and this is like another compressed version of that image. Humans would choose this right one, but if you were doing L2, so this one has a lower mean square error compared to these two. Clearly, but the right one is much better, right? So this is again another illustration of what we have seen. But more interestingly, even SM, which we just talked about, would choose this one. Whereas their method, like whatever, these three different networks, think of this as some learned representation, some distance metric over these deep embeddings, would have chosen this patch. So it shows that like, you know, these neural nets, the embeddings learned through them may be doing something more similar to humans. Yeah. We're not gonna go through this. The important idea really is this line here, that what you can do is for each image, you can extract its embeddings, which is just the output of this pre-learned neural nets. And then you can define some distance between these embeddings as a proxy to whatever your distortion measure between these two images. And again, it's now like very commonly, it's quite reported. Uh, one first, I'm gonna skip this. Okay, any, any questions? No? Okay. And so the third idea is this VMAF. I'm actually not going to go into details of, uh, of this, but again, like the basic idea here really is you have some predefined features. So you have some predefined spatial features. Think of this VIF DLM as some metrics like SM. Like we can talk about it, but think of them as like brothers of SM. Like people did more work at, in the similar class of defining low level vision. And then you can extract all of these. But then finally, like how you combine all this four or five different existing, actually exactly two, but how you combine these metrics which exist at low level humans is now you train a machine learning model to figure out how to combine these metrics by collecting a lot of human data. So you ask a lot of people, okay, which one do you prefer? Which one do you prefer? Which one do you prefer? And then you try to figure out, okay, what's the right distance? And that's like another idea of coming up with a perceptual metric, right? And so these trained parameters are fixed and then you can use that as another distortion metric. So these are like the, going back, so these are roughly like how I tried to summarize this sort of area. So there are roughly three kind of three classes of things which people are doing to sort of come up with new distortion metrics. Very, very hot area of research. So like, I think it's, it's far from mature. So uh, if you want to contribute, it's like, um, like you can make big impact <laughs> by contributing. Okay, any questions? Then we'll just do the last part of where human vision can play a role. Okay, so so far we have looked at two things. Traditional compressors, like how a lot of design decisions. The second one was, oh, MSE is bad, so let's figure out like what are the right distortion measures which are perceptually relevant. Now the third thing is actually even more interesting. So we have talked about rate distortion trade-off, but again, a very recent work, this is I think 2018-19, so all of this, all of these are like very new, <laughs> talks about rate distortion and perception trade-off. And here is like a screenshot, um, screenshot from, from this paper, which I think is very illustrative. So let's say you have an image. So this is like, you're sitting outside at Stanford, 
you saw some grass you click the picture okay this is what that image looks like compressed using jpeg okay and the third one is think of it as a deep it's a fake image it's a neural net generated image of that grass which all which says statistically represent grass but it's not exactly the same grass how do i know uh, maybe look at this strand here you see there is a strand here there is the strand here there is no strand here right so it's just a general grass generated grass okay but if i ask you <laughs> like amongst b and c which reconstruction do you prefer how many of you say b how many of you would say c b or c <laughs> Oh. B compared with A or C compared with A, which one would you prefer? Let's say A was your source image. One compressor compresses it to B, the other to C. Okay, maybe C. That's not a bad. Yeah, like I think I would prefer C, uh, but because B is like it's just blurred, even though it has the right strands everywhere. But clearly, C has a very high distortion in terms of MSC. It's just like random arrangement of strands. but we as humans don't really care about these strands right if this was somebody's face we would be like mad right like if somebody's face was distorted like this we'll just lose our uh, lose our stuff but uh, like for this grass or in general for a lot of texture kind of images and details for example this carpet i don't really care where exactly this is as long as statistically they are somewhat similar or in other words perceptually they look the same and that's really like sort of a very new and upcoming area both in terms of theory and practice and lots of open and interesting questions there which is how do you account for this perception when you are doing compression essentially it's not just about rate distortion maybe i should think about the perception aspect too and so this is like another example from this paper so what they do is like okay you have some rate definition don't worry about the symbols your rate is some function of x x hat you have some distortion which is expected value of we have been looking at d as a symbol for distortion now you also have you also model perception and the way you model perception is some distance between the probability distributions of your original and reconstructed because at the end of the day your perception is like some statistical some 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 measurement on the probability distribution and now instead of doing just r plus lambda d you would try to basically play with these three parameters so not just trade off two but maybe play with three right um so here is basically an example of what happens let's just look at this last row okay so if uh, sorry yeah last row so this is an input and i'm trying so this are mnist digits which we also saw uh, in the last class so same mnist digits um and now i'm trying to compress it to two bits and then decode sorry compress it to two bits and then decode using different trade offs between the distortion and perception so i fix the rate i can change my distortion and perception right so the first column here is what happens if you were to optimally compress it using shannon so just rate distortion you don't care about the perception and as you move to the right you give higher and higher penalty for perception so you care more and more about perception what do you see is that at two bits like this is very blurred i like this is like right versus as you keep going towards right it's become higher and higher fidelity but now what might happen is like your numbers might not match exactly because again the same thing is like here the strands didn't match exactly here the numbers won't match exactly so there is some trade off so as to say which you now need to figure out between what exact distortion and perceptions you can work with and obviously at i think something which is very important to understanding this is if you had infinite rate if you are working in a high bandwidth high streaming kind of an application sure you would like to represent everything exactly but the more and more advantages of this rdp or taking perception into account starts coming as you are really rate limited right because then you can't spend a lot of bits to represent each of that msc like perfectly right at it's not at that point it's not about seeing the most pristine most like all the edges the perfect image in your hd tv right at that point you care more about something which is 
more acceptable to me than like maybe these blood symbols like these blood symbols is something like as a human i won't accept like this is extremely bad quality i would rather expect maybe slight distortions maybe not at this this extreme where my 5 became 7 right so this is just bad but maybe at 4 bits this 5 being 5 is nice right so something to be basically it's it's very up and coming and something to think about and really maybe right like it's it's really interesting and important and so all of this is nice so this is like sort of some theory component and there are some very nice new theorems so if you guys like the theory part of rd like again these are not old papers these are like 2019 i think uh, if i recall correctly um and so like more recently even or like even otherwise like so this paper talks about that you can bound the maximum so ideally you would like to bound some error on the distortion right like you wouldn't want like okay if i go for perception i should completely change the number if i do that then that's a very bad bad thing right i can't really work with that formulation but so for example in theory what this paper showed is that oh if you were under certain star mark certain conditions you can bound the error in distortion even if you were optimally optimizing for perception so that's a good result that then starts saying that okay if i do this smartly maybe it won't be ever it won't be the case ever that my five becomes one i'm may, i'm being hand wavy but that's really the idea so having and there is like lot of open field there people haven't really explored this as much whereas rd has been explored for past 50 years right 50 60 years so again if you're interested in theory something nice to look forward to uh but in practice also like this rdp framework is already been used in many different senses so recall this picture from a lab compression lecture right we had we had this particular image and then we were trying to optimize d and i said that one of the very <laughs> very good benefits about this framework is this distortion is really up to us for the side right like i can plug in anything as long as it's differentiable back so idea one uh i want to take into account perception we instead of messi or like in our notebook we had i think l1 error mean absolute error instead of that maybe i can take s and you saw sm was just mean and sigma so it's a linear operator it's differentiable right so nice i can do that and now i'm i'll suddenly get a learn compressor which is more optimized for sm and it will probably already perform better in terms of like the the visual characteristics for human but maybe like i i can do even more i can i can add my i can also add my weighted msc loss with my perceptual metric the idea really there is that like so for example i can have mean absolute error as well as my l pips and the idea for the, and this is actually quite commonly used like i think i don't know i don't want to say 100 but almost almost all of learned image and video compressors actually use like a loss something which looks like this where you have some distortion term really and some some perceptual term and the idea there really is what we saw right like so distortion term kind of ensures that you don't run away and just completely start making up stuff uh, whereas this l pips for example like l pips won't really care about pixel level details right it's finding these higher level encoding structures and it would probably say like okay these two are similar so this is like idea number 2 so when you are training like models you can probably use mae for keep keeping track of like distortion that you don't really get very far away in terms of the actual pixel values and then you can also use some deep embeddings like elpips to keep track of perceptually right so at that point you're tracking keeping track of the distributions px and px dash and then like okay if you're not really happy with this you can do even more stuff for example maybe you can use like if if it's fine if you're not aware don't worry about it but if you have heard of gans in your life adversarial networks use some framework like that to train now instead of just your encoder and generator you can also train like a discriminator which now figures out whether i and i i dash are same or not and in principle what this discriminator gan is doing is exactly like the perceptual loss it's basically trying to ensure that i and i dash comes from the same probability distribution 
right? So these are like various ideas people try to do a mix of these. More recently, I don't have uh, I don't have slide on that I know, but uh, more recently, like there have been even more amazing works with like uh, like now we know past year, literally past year when we were doing this, like generative modeling has really grown leaps and bounds in terms of what you can generate from what kind of distributions you can generate fake symbols, right? And so that even more so brings this idea of perception, right? Like this px px dash term into the center of compression. Uh, a lot of people are trying to now use deep neural nets, like deep, your stable diffusion and your favorite, uh, whatever your favorite these days is, with respect LLMs for generation, maybe for text, so like Shubham showed something, right? So um, there we were doing lossless, but now you can also think how that can be exploited for lossy, right? Like you can just keep the output of the LLM as is. And so it's, it's very, it's very hot area in terms of like even in the last year, right? So how you can maybe use all these advancements towards compression. LLM seems to have the knowledge of the world, but like how do we actually get it to a point so that we can actually use that for compression and get really low bit rates with respect to things, right? So I think it's the same idea in images, but with respect to now like stable diffusion, it's the exact same thing. Or if you know about multimodal clip models, DALI, things like these, so all of these can in terms, like if you are more interested in the practical angle of this, like RDP takes a center stage there using these models, for example. Okay. So, yeah, so there is like, for example, this, so I just talked about GAN, there is this paper called Hi-Fi C, which you should check out. Um, don't worry about this plot, but basically it uses conditional GANs plus LPEPs in loss, and it achieved like state of the art two years ago. Right, so the only thing, again, like terms which you probably are now more comfortable at least hearing or know the resources where to get go learn more from are at the center stage in very recent years being used in very interesting ways. So yeah, I hope like today's lecture, you really got the idea that like we talk a lot about engineering, but a lot of uh, neuroscience and psychovisual aspects are actually at the center of engineering uh, and designing these systems. And it's really important to understand them if we are designing like lossy compressors. So we talked about images in detail that has been center. We touched a little bit on audio. We showed a very basic compressor. We talked about 44.1 uh, kilo, whatever it is. But in future, there are new and new data modalities which are coming up. Like compression is not limited to like image videos or audio, right? There is, for example, VR stuff, there is uh, genomics, there is many other, many other modalities of sensor data. And all of this data is being used for some application. And really what I want to highlight at the end of this class, it's not just about human perception. At the end of the day, if you're designing a lossy compressor for any niche area, it's very important to understand what that data is and in what application it is being used so, as, so that you can you don't just use design something for MSC, but be more more smart and intelligent about like what other access you can exploit, which typically gives like huge gains in specific applications. So yeah, I think I'll. Uh, this is it. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs>